Vinod, please request the students to join. Yes, sir. Musadik, how are you doing? Hello, sir. Uh, how are you doing? Sir, I'm recovering, sir. This, uh, I can uh, lift the hand a bit, sir, but not hmm. proper. Uh, okay. But but uh, whenever I move, I feel some, uh, I feel my arm some heavy and uh, a bit of pain after some uh, walking. Yes, so slowly you have to start moving now because. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm moving. So start yes. Moving. Yeah. And start coming to the lab. So walking and all will be necessary. OK. Yes, sir. Mm. Slowly start coming to the lab. OK, just spend yes. some time. Mm. Yes, sir. I was also thinking about uh, going to lab from next week. Yeah. You know, have you reminded them? Yes, sir. I have already. Actually, sir, uh, some some of the students are having, I think, placement talk. So, so they just got notification for that. Uh, so they are uh, on the group. They are saying. So I do. I am currently talking to them only. Yeah, just request them to join quickly. OK, yes, yes.
What, what is the issue here, Saurabh? Actually, sir, some of some students are having uh, a placement talk. So they are saying that they have just got notification for that. And I told them to join. Placement talk from what time? So about that, I don't know. So mm -hmm. actually, all they had that notification. Yeah, any idea, Karan? Any idea? What is the issue? Sir, actually, I think it is with the PhD students. Like the PhD students have some placement talk. I am from B Tech, so like I don't think PhD there is. PhD students, Musadik, you know any any notification here? Sir, I don't uh, think so. It is for so it PhD. is for M Tech, sir. Okay. And so yes, sir. Actually, I think. I think this is uh, for petroleum sciences and technology. At our time, also we had something like this. It is organized so actually, by training and placement cell. Yeah. So where are the B Tech students? I think B Tech students are also not coming, right? I think placement talk is for everyone. Means uh, B Tech and M Tech. Why do they arrange during the class time? Anyways, let us go ahead with the. So actually, I am worrying worried because you know this is a very um, important part of the whole course, right? So yeah, so I think you know they have started the recording, right? Yes, sir. Of, I have started. Yes, sir. Yeah. So let yes, us go sir. ahead with the class. So let me share the uh, lecture notes. OK, so most probably by next week you will get the evaluated copies. OK. So my screen is visible to all of you, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. So we were discussing about the weightability of the surfaces, right? So essentially, like you know, say suppose if you have a surface, if you if you if you if you put a drop, say this is any liquid and this is a solid surface. So you have different possibilities like film formation, lens formation, okay, and drop formation. So this type of surfaces are typically called this is a this is going to happen. This type of configuration you may see to happen in a Super hydrophobic surface, right? And this type of configuration is going to happen in a super hydrophilic surface. Now, whenever I am using the terminology hydrophilic, that means it is related to water. If it is for any solvent, I am going to call this as a lyophilic. Okay. Similarly, I will call this as a lyophobic. Right. However, the more more practical situations are this. In general, you will find, you know, most of the situations it will happen like that. And while finishing the last class, we after we went through the surface tension measurement and all, where is that slide? It is a little later. So we, we could really get the different weightability conditions that if I have a high energy surface on top of that, I will have a, a low energy liquid will spread. And if I have a low energy surface on top of that, a high energy liquid. So, so this uh, in this sort of situation, in this sort of situation, I may expect that the film formation, whereas in this sort of situation, I may expect the lens formation. And we did really go through different cases, case one, case two, case three, case four, case five, case six, that even if I have a multiple layer, how do I interpret the whole situation in the form of a spreading coefficient? Okay, so this we have already discussed. Now, this knowledge, say suppose you have a substrate, you have a substrate here, right? And there is a liquid coming in, 
This we are going to take into the next level. OK, how? Now here we are going to get our interpretation to the to the molecular level. And you will find a lot of insights will emerge, you know, as you go towards like, you know, macroscopic earlier we were talking about the surface tension, which is a measurable quantity at the macroscopic level. Now we are going to see how exactly you. You 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 channelize that uh, that knowledge in the at the in the in the molecular level. Right. The first set of demarcation is done at the level of whether the surface is polar or apolar. And whether the liquid is polar or apolar. So this is the first level of demarcation. What do I mean by polar? So suppose if I look at methane, you know, we know that the dipole moment is zero for methane. Right? It is a it is having a tetrahedral structure. And if I do a vector summation of all this, you know, if we know that carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen. So there is a net minus and plus here, net minus and plus here for related to each and every bond. And if you just you know have a kind of vector. Uh, summation of all these electric fields in different directions, you know, net vector you will find to be the electric field to be zero. So essentially this is a apolar molecule. Whereas if I really look at oxygen flanked by two hydrogen with a pair of lone pairs here and here, which is also a similar to tetrahedral geometry with the negative here, positive here, negative here and positive here. This particular entity has a permanent dipole moment. And this the, here the dipole moment is zero. Right now this rises to the nature of different types of surfaces and liquid to be polar and apolar. Like say, suppose if you have a water droplet that will be a polar molecule. If you have a hexane droplet that is more towards apolar. OK, if you have if you have cyclohexane more towards apolar, if you have chloroform that is more towards polar. Right, so likewise, so surface tension. The overall surface tension, you know, can be divided. This is there is a reason to it. Let me just, you know, explain that part a little bit more. What are the different combinations that are possible at the level of polarity? and apolarity, right? So suppose you have a surface. Which is which is polar in nature. You have a polar surface. Highly polar surface, the surface is having dipole moment, some dipole moment. Now you bring in a liquid which is apolar. Now question is what is going to happen? Correct, so you have different types of I mean, if I say apolar to be A and polar to be P, you can really think about a substrate droplet combination to be PP. Say suppose, sorry. Suppose this is AP. Okay, say suppose then this is AA. And say suppose this is this is PA. So you can have different combinations different combinations where both can be apolar, both can be polar, one of them can be polar or apolar. Question is that in that sort of situation, what will be the fate of the fate of the surface tension? How do you interpret the surface tension in that situation? Question is that if I put a polar material on a polar surface, is it going to wait or is it going to form a lens? If I'm going to, if I'm going to put a polar material on an apolar surface, whether this is going to wait or whether this is going to form a lens, right? So for that, you need a little bit more deeper insight. And this has already been done in science that, you know, you don't mix up these two things. There's no necessity of mixing up the surface tension of the polar part and apolar part. Rather, you know, you just, you know, separate them. So gamma LW is the part of the surface tension that is associated with LW means Lipschitz van der Waals. That means this is the apolar part. Okay, 
and gamma ab ab stands for the acid base this is this is so lw is lipheus van der waals and ab is acid base so this is the polar part associated with that so how do you calculate say suppose if the gamma is the surface tension then how do you calculate say suppose you have you have two two different materials say suppose you have you have one sorry so you you have you have you have one here and you have two here so this is gamma 1 and this is gamma 2 now you want to know what is gamma 1 2 what is the interfacial tension that is at the level of the polar interaction people have found out that you know if you have gamma 1 lw minus root over gamma 2 lw whole square i am coming what is this gamma 1 lw and gamma 2 lw these are they are also experimentally measured so this gamma 1 is going to have one part which is gamma 1 lw plus gamma 1 ab whereas gamma 2 will also have gamma 2 lw and gamma 2 ab right so now in that gamma 1 2 lw will be root over gamma 1 lw minus root over gamma 2 lw whole square whereas gamma 2 ab will be 2 into root over gamma plus gamma minus gamma 2 minus gamma plus so this is the combination of the polar the positive and the negative component right now we are going to see what is this gamma lw what is this gamma plus and what is this gamma minus now say suppose if you take a table where you like to see what is the what is the surface and say suppose water right if you look at water you will find that this this 72.8 whatever you see the, say suppose water has a gamma of what water gamma of water is how much gamma of water is about 72.8 now what this particular table tells that gamma lw of water is how much 21.8 that means gamma ab is how much gamma ab is is how much can anybody tell me gamma ab is how much 72.8 and 21.8 so gamma ab will be how much so you know that gamma is equal to gamma lw plus gamma ab so gamma ab will be how much jaldi se bolo baba 51 say 51 right now in that what you say that sorry what you say that In that, what you say that gamma plus will be 25.5 and gamma minus will be what? 25.5. Okay, because when you are having the dipolar separation, it will always be, if it is happening automatically, it will always be equal. So here you may see, see when I am talking about when I'm talking about heptane, octane, right? You already know for all these materials, what is the, see you have, you will have a row, you will have a column here. What is the total gamma associated with this, which is already there in the literature. What this table tells you, that what is the LW component? And from the LW component, you are able to figure out what is the gamma AB. And gamma AB from gamma AB, you can get gamma plus and gamma minus, which will be the equal amount. Now let us look back the, the, the polar and apolar components. So surface tension, we are going to go a little bit one level more deeper in the next, uh, next few slides. But for the time being, you accept the fact that surface tension has a apolar component, which is indicated by LW, Lifshitz van der Waals. I'm going to describe, discuss why this is called like that. And the other component is the polar, which is called the acid base component. Now, you can say that this, why do you use this terminology acid base? Because traditionally people have been using, you know, there's a lot of literature that has been developed before realizing that it is, it is, it is, it is bigger than whatever acid base interactions are there, right? But then now the literature has been developed. People follow this terminology that you have to really take into account the gamma LW and gamma AB separately. Now, you just have to be a bit careful here because 
let me just go back to that part. I have not left really, you know, the idea of surface tension in somewhere else while I while I'm discussing this. Okay, I'm going to come back to this picture over a period of time. Right, but right now, essentially, what am I going to try? Let's say, suppose this two is a polar material, and suppose this one is an apolar material. So, at the interface, how the interaction is going to take place? And now, these interactions are what is the contribution from the polar components, and what is the contribution from the apolar components, and how do we, elementary, from the elementary understanding, how do we separate them out? in terms of their interactions between each other. Right? So question is that, say when one is interacting with two, what type of interaction is this? Is it a polar-polar interaction? Is it a polar-apolar interaction? Now, because of this interaction, what is the energy that is being released in the form of addition or addition failure? Right? And how the understanding develops and how do I calculate, how do I measure that that, that, that the work of addition or the force associated with that, what is the recipe for that? This is where we are getting into. Okay. So just to give you a clearer picture that to first is to say that at the level of the interface, at the level of the surface, we first divide the, the entire set of interactions into two parts. One is the apolar interaction, other is the polar interaction. Now, obviously when I do that, then you know there will be a set of apolar interaction, there will be a set of polar interaction, and there will be a set of polar apolar interaction. Correct? How do I do that? When I have a when I when when I when I add up, I add up only the uh, apolar interaction. I add up only the polar interaction. Now when I make it total, you will see that this apolar and polar gives me the total polar apolar interaction. This is just by using binary rules. You know we are able to we are able to really really show that you know this will be the this is the general possibility right now say suppose if you if you if you calculate the helmholtz free energy total helmholtz free energy of 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 this thing so you will find that say suppose if one is surrounded by three and two you know it comes out to be like this now say suppose for water uh, what is gamma gamma 1 2 so it is about like you know when you have when you have 21.8 so 21 point is gamma lw right so go root over gamma 1 lw root over gamma 2 lw right so you get those numbers say suppose if you have an interface which is between water and octane okay water and octane will become zero say suppose methanol and water so gamma 1 lw gamma 2 lw is there so you calculate gamma 1 and gamma 2 lw and then whatever is the total surface tension of water and methanol from there you deduct this in order to get what is the surface tension, what is the ab component and that you divide by 2 in order to get this gamma plus and gamma minuses okay and from there you can calculate the gamma the total gamma that is coming from the individual components and total free energy that is released because of the addition say so suppose this is where you are talking about there are three Three materials. Say, suppose you have you have the, the the layers that we were discussing. Say, you know you have you have this is this is a bulb. Say say suppose this is an oil. Okay. Say suppose this is water. Suppose this is water. So you have you have an oil film in between the two water mediums. So this is say suppose this is one. Say suppose this is two. Say suppose this is three. Right. Or you may interpret this one surrounded by two and three. Now, in that sort of situation, if you just cook up, like you know, gamma, gamma. So in this case, one two is given means. Sorry. In this case, you know, it is given one two means. You know, the interpretation will be like this. So this is one, this is two, and this is three. Okay. So gamma one two is the final. So these one and two are coming together minus gamma one three minus gamma two three, and then respective. You know, when you are taking all these individual interactions together, you will get this formula coming from, you know, when you are just, you know, taking the say gamma 1, 2 AB, gamma 1, 3 AB and gamma 2, 3 AB. So that will be nothing but this entire formula. So for this is for the binary interfacial tension. We say this is for the, you know, draining of this day, draining or stabilizing of this three. In that case, you know, what is the, what is the, what is the 
final interfacial tension in terms of what is the final interfacial tension in terms of in terms of the addition or the addition failure weighting or deweighting okay looks a little bit tricky but i'm going to get into a little bit little bit deeper then you will see when we come back to this things will be straightforward now from where these suddenly you know this polar a polar how do we really get a, a bigger control over this polar a polar and all these you know terminologies so you know the scientists have really defined this polar a polar business you know they have defined three different terminologies okay they have defined three different terminologies in order to really identify this correct so they say that one is called kisam the other is called dibai and third is called london there can be you know they, these are the three most probable you know interactions between a molecule a set of molecules across the interface so this is a molecule a so suppose this is molecule this is a material a this is material b if they face each other <clears throat> there are three different ways to interact with them okay the first one is called the london what is this say suppose these are all molecules which has got zero dipole moment there is no no polarity associated with that there is no polarity at all they are they are all charge neutral i mean electrons are moving in such a manner in an idealized state that there is no fluctuation and there is no dipole moment at all in that sort of situation moment you bring in one surface towards the other surface what will happen because of this electromagnetic field there will be some distortion of electron cloud here and because of this electromagnetic field of b there will be some distortion of cloud in a so a will induce some field in b b will induce some field in b which is a temporary in nature in their absence that these all these influences will go away and that interaction is called the induced dipole induced dipole interaction or london interaction okay now the other way around is say b is polar and a is apolar right now since b is polar b can b can interact with a when when b is coming towards a so this dipole will 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 create an induced dipole of this so this type of interaction is called the dipole induced dipole interaction so a dipole can induce a dipole on a neutral charge neutral material that is called the dipole induced dipole or the debye interaction and the third variety is called the kisam interaction which is more standard electrostatic interaction there is a dipole there is a dipole and they either have an interaction like you know either they attract or repel either they attract or repel that means you know say what we are suggesting here you can very clearly see now say you know uh, is all all at the level of all at the level of at the boundary this is all at the level of the electro static interactions okay say suppose you are having a dipole which is plus and minus this is a polar molecule and suppose you have another one here which is minus plus which is a polar molecule they are going to attract each other so this is going to make sure that say the liquid droplet that is coming in because of this polar polar okay dipole dipole interaction dipole dipole interaction right which is called the kisam interaction right now this dipolar dipolar interaction is going to do what this water droplet will come down and will 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 spread because because this this attractive force is stabilize the whole situation in the form of like you know there will be an electrostatic attraction force and there will be release of energy associated with the delta g will be released here you know there will be a free energy release there is an energy release here because like you know they are attracting each other similarly you can think about that you know say suppose this is plus and minus and suppose you know this also has a situation which is plus and minus so while while this sort of situation will promote a hydrophilicity hydrophilic you know nature this sort of interaction will promote what hydrophobic nature 
And what is the origin that you finally see here? The origin is nothing but the three types of interaction that are coming. One is dipole-dipole interaction, electrostatic interaction. Second is dipole-induced dipole electrostatic interaction. Say suppose you have an electron cloud which is extremely charged, neutral and spherical. But you bring in a molecule, you know, which has an electron cloud like this in front of that. So because of this electron cloud heterogeneity in the electron cloud, it has a, say suppose it has a net dipole moment in this direction. Moment you bring in that, what happens? This electron cloud also get distorted based on the alignment that is there here. Now, once it happens, then, you know, because of this induced dipole moment, you have a charge separation here. But moment you withdraw this, you know, this goes back to again due to its original charge neutral position. Right. So you can see that while dipole dipole can create attraction and repulsion, dipole indu induced dipole will do what? Will it be will it repel anytime? Will it repel anytime? What will it do? Say no, whenever no. it will not, right? What what it will do instead of repelling, what it will do? In case of induced dipole situation, say suppose you have two induced dipoles, right? Say there is there is one there is one spherical cloud, there is another spherical cloud. Now this is coming closer towards each other. They are getting a little bit distorted because of this interaction between that and generating a plus minus, which is this is inducing that, this is inducing that. So what type of interaction do you expect here? Attractive or repelling? Attractive. Induction is always attractive, right? This yes. is one very important thing that you have to remember, right? Now, what is the difference between this attraction and this attraction? Will there be a difference when you have dipole-dipole interaction between the opposite charges, electrostatic Coulombic interaction, right? What is the difference between this interaction and this interaction? What is the difference between this attraction and that attraction? Any idea? Uh, I think in the dipole dipole interaction, there will be uh, the force of attraction will be more, but in the uh, case of uh, here induced induction, so it will be uh, such that uh, it, it just induces the attracted the charge towards uh, the other. Uh. So the interaction will be very weak interaction. You know, rather the attraction in any induced situation, the attraction will be a very weak attraction. So now, if you go back to the lecture note, this is very, very important. These are all yeah. fundamental things. You know, if you're not, yeah. Anybody want to say anything? Yeah, sir, sir in case of uh, dipole dipole uh, and in case of induced dipole, induced dipole, mm -hmm. uh, whether in the first case there is no polarization, whereas in the second case there is much polarization. So, no, because no, first of... case dipole is already polarized. Okay. So, in the case of induced dipole side, it is also polarized. Induced dipole is. For until, say, suppose induced dipole, say, suppose you have two spheres, right? They are charge neutral. But if you bring this sphere towards this, since this is closer to that and this is this part is further to that, you know, what may happen, you know, if this is, this is a little bit plus, this is a little bit minus. So this is going to create a little bit minus and little bit plus here. This is because of the very small distortion of the cloud. So this one induces this plus minus here. This one induces this plus minus here. So finally, there will be a very weak attractive force. It will always be attractive. Induction is always will lead to attraction because this is influencing that, this is influencing that. Whereas when you have a dipole, it is already the water molecule starts separated like this. The other water molecule is charge separated like that, right? This this is already carrying. This is not because of induction. They, this is the molecular nature. So in this situation, a electrostatic, a columbic repulsion, right? That is obvious. And this effect will be this effect will be more. This will be very high. This will be much higher in terms of order of magnitude than this weak attractive, you know interaction for the dipole induced dipole or induced dipole induced dipole. Is it clear Govindo? Sir is it clear but though one doubt is there 
sir in the second case as you are saying induced dipole induced dipole the polarization uh, is higher there in uh, in the latter case sir or no here no no here the polarization is very less it is delta plus and delta minus no 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 in the second case sir in the upper one as you are saying the polarization ah. is higher so pol it is already polarized hmm say when you think about water it is already polarized there is already a dipole moment net dipole moment associated with this yes correct correct sir yes sir correct so now hmm. the other when another water molecule is coming in based on this dipole moment the interaction is going to take place see there is already two very strong dipoles are sitting with each other how are they aligning that hmm. is going to be decided by their dipole and their electrostatic interaction hmm. whereas for induced the the adaptability is going on based on the association but mm. it will always be weakly attractive while because you know it's all depends on what is the electron cloud just in my immediate when i am bringing in something the other electron cloud is going to modulate the way i am bringing in the thing so then you will always have a weak attractive interaction in the induced dipole dipole and induced dipole induced dipole interaction is that clear with everybody yes sir all are with me any doubt here by anybody now see the beauty of the game is that most of the molecular level processes see you are convinced that you know dipole dipole interaction is the is the dominant one right whereas induced dipole induced dipole interaction will be way below in terms of their uh in terms of their influence but most of the you know processes which are from say suppose 1 nanometer to 20 nanometer which we call the colloidal domain in that place this induced dipole induced dipole and dipole induced dipole become the dominant force and you know this becomes the the weaker force this dipole dipole interaction becomes insignificant in most of the situation whereas this becomes the most predominant force question is why any idea why this induced dipole induced dipole interaction you know they play the predominant role in terms of determining the things at the level of like you know say say when you are see i am talking about 1 nanometer to 20 nanometer you i have the hint there say suppose if i am talking about 1 nanometer to 20 nanometer right so how many atoms are there typically what is the atomistic length scale by the way anybody what is the atomistic or molecular length scale by the way anybody jaldi se bolo baba angstrom sir ha angstrom say suppose 5 angstrom right means how much 0.5 nanometer right yes sir so 1 nanometer to 20 nanometer you expect how many molecules about 1000 molecules uh, yes right now in that situation you can think about this is nothing but a molecular aggregate right yes. so at the level of molecular aggregation you will find that induced dipole induced dipole interactions or dipole induced dipole the induction basically the induction effect will play a predominant role than the dipolar one why because moment the aggregate happens no say so suppose if these things are aggregating to a to a system now you can understand that they are more or less nullifying their electrostatic field okay say so suppose if if five molecules you know or 10 molecules they are aggregating with each other which is a say suppose there is a definite dipole moment right say plus and minus for a molecule and they are getting aggregated into this form right so when they are getting aggregated into this form say suppose this is a nanoparticle so in that process these dipoles are like you know more or less nullified because they have already exhausted their attractive force to make this colloidal aggregate in that sort of situation when you bring in the surface right the entire interaction so in this one also like you know you will find like you know dipolar aggregates 
will exhaust their attractive because the dipole is already there. Right? Otherwise, you know, if dipole is not nullified, they will not aggregate like that. But moment to bring in a surface like this towards this surface, since they have more or less exhausted their dipolar features, since they are exhausting mode of dipolar features, now they are going to interact in the mode of what? Whatever is the remaining dipole moment or effective dipole moment. Whatever is the remaining or effective dipole moment of this, okay, which will be very small, and the induced dipole moment. Whatever is this field, electron associated with the electron cloud, and the influence of that to generate a field here, and the influence of this to generate a field here, now that is going to be the major factor because when the molecular aggregate takes place, they have more or less nullified their dipole moments. Right? And this is where the first concept of the real gas came. So this is the genius of Antovas. So before that, people were using the ideal gas law, Boyle's law, Charles' law, right? PV equal to NRT to describe things. But he said that, you know, you are making two major mistakes here. What are the two major mistakes? Number one, you are excluding the size. There is nothing called a point mass. Why this is important? Because, you know, it is not important when they are far away. But when they are close to each other, they cannot overlap, overlap each other. This is where, you know, say suppose V, the volume you are considering, that is not the case. You know, you have V minus NB. So the volume, effective volume for the movement and mean free path is less by this amount. Okay. And then what is suggested that, okay, you are saying that pressure is P. Pressure means, you know, this is going and hitting the surface. This is going and hitting the surface. This is going and hitting the surface and generating the force, force, force. And then you are considering the force per unit area. He said that, you know, this is not the only force. You have the additional force because of the interaction, different types of interaction. This is interacting with this. This is interacting with that. Different types of forces are in action. What are the different types of force? There are three types of forces in action. One is dipole-dipole. Then one is induced dipole-dipole. And the other is induced dipole-induced dipole. If you add all the three things, so what you get, you will get effectively a larger amount of pressure, which is P plus A by V squared. Now, this component is coming because of these three forces, the effective dipole that is remaining, effective dipole generating induced dipole in the other surfaces, and the induced dipole, induced dipole, all together you have additional pressure you know, on the wall because of the interactions. So, you can see that the ideal gas law is getting modified into the real gas law, this was the Van der Waals proposition. Of course, there were a lot of changes. This is called the cubic equation of state. People later realized that it is not as simple as what Van der Waals thought. You know, this, this, is, this is more of a kind of averaging of all the interactions that he did here. But at the end of the day, it is not going to work this way. This is, these are, these, 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 whatever I have drawn here, these are all statistical in nature. So today you can see the emergence of molecular simulations and all where people generally you know, do a kind of statistical averaging of all these interaction in order to find out the net interaction, whatever is the remaining interaction. Because you know, if these two are colliding and nullifying some of the forces between each other, that is not going to manifest on the wall. So you have to really do a kind of pairwise interaction with all the molecules to see that. Now, say suppose this one is coming closer towards each other. If they are polar and oppositely charged, they will have an electrostatic attraction. Otherwise, if they are both apolar, then they will have an induced dipole, induced dipole interaction when they are coming close to each other. So how exactly I go about, I do a bottom up method in order to really sum up all these interactions together. What I do, I say that I don't complicate the problem further. I say that, you know, I define a potential between two, two point masses, which has a definite volume. I have two point masses with a finite volume. Okay. And that potential I define as 
This is called the Lennard Jones 6 12 potential. There are different types of potential available 4, 8, right? You know, 8, 8, 16, different types of potential. The most popular one is called the 6 12 potential. What does it say? That says, suppose if you have a if you have an atom which is a nucleus, and this is the electron. I'm just simplifying the whole thing. This is the hard part in the center of the nucleus, which is positively charged, and this is the electron cloud that is rotating. And I have another similar molecule, similar molecule, similar, similar atom, which is this is the nucleus plus, and this is the electron cloud minus. If they come closer towards each other, this this nucleus will attract this cloud. This nucleus will attract this electron cloud. So initially they will feel a attractive force between them. However, when they come very close to each other, what will happen? You know, this electron cloud will repel this electron cloud and this uh, nucleus will repel this nucleus. So you may see that phi is equal to minus A by S to the power 6. 6 means when they are far away, the force is higher. Now, if you plot this, if you plot this potential, the potential will look like this with respect to S. If you plot phi, say suppose you know this is your x and y axis here you are plotting phi and this is s s is the separation distance between this these two materials so you will find that you know you know this this you know phi is equal to we have written that minus a by you know s to the power 6 plus b by you know s to the power 12 so you may find that when they are very far away say suppose infinite very far away this is very close to the abscess Abscissa. And then, you know, it beyond, beyond a certain point, this is of the order of, say, less than 100 nanometer, you know, you will find that this attractive force will start increasing. More negative means this attractive force is increasing, right? In the point when they come very close to each other, you will find the repulsive arm will go up. And this particular point is called the equilibration or the cutoff point, you know, where, you know, this electron cloud with the nucleus, they have just touched this one. This is the point. Beyond which, you know, they may not move because there is a physical existence of, there is a territory that is, that is the size that is associated with this atom. So, you will not find them moving beyond that particular point, okay? So, this is the hypothesis van der Waals put forward saying that now this attractive force which is you are talking about is to, is to the power 6 are of three different types a london a kism and a divide okay now how do you how do you how do you get it you see that you know they will do simple coulombic processes so what is alpha? Alpha is the polarizability. Can anybody tell me what is a polarizability? Anybody has any idea what is polarizability? Jaldi se batao. All of you know what is polarizability. What is polarizability? What is polarizability? Jaldi se batao. Kisi ko pata nahi hai what is polarizability? Musa Tik, what is polarizability? Uh, I think it is uh, ability uh, how it uh, one can polarize others. Uh, one atoms can polarize. Karan, what is polarizability? Uh, sir, I think it is basically like when a uh, of material is placed in an electric field or in in front of a dipole the positive charges shift to one side and the negative charges shift to one side and that is the polarizability so it is the measure of what sir it is basically the measure of uh, th th this tendency to develop these charges like uh, the positive and the negative induced charge. dipole formation yes, yes yes if you have an electron cloud if you bring in some electric field how that electron cloud is going to get polarized. This is what is polarizability. Say if you have an electron cloud which is charge neutral, 
if you bring in an electric field, what may happen that this charge neutral electron cloud may not remain charge neutral, it may get polarized. How much, how much delta plus delta minus is possible? That is a fundamental material property and defined by this constant called alpha. For a given material, you can measure this alpha. You know, there's a documented literature on this alpha, and that is what is called the polarizability. Like mu is the dipole moment. For a given material, you have the dipole moment. Okay. And nu is the nu is the orbiting frequency. Nu is the nu is the orbiting frequency of electron. Right, so nu is the orbiting frequency of the electron. So here you see nu one square, nu two square by three kT is a measure of what? The measure of the dipole-dipole interaction, which is a k. Nu one square alpha two is a measure of the induced dipole-dipole interaction, which is a d d by. And alpha one, alpha two h nu one, nu two is a measure of the London, the induced dipole-induced dipole interaction. So you just you know add all these together. To get the potential for the Van der Waals interaction, which is the 612 interaction, and you write it like that. This is for two atoms with one having a both having a nucleus and the electron cloud. This is the simplest possible way of imagining a model that can describe the complex thing as we progress. Right? So sir, you may see, yeah. Sir, can we say that polarizability is polarizing power, or is there any difference between the two terms. Uh, we will come to the entire details of polarization, maybe another few lectures. You know, we will spend more time on how exactly that happens. OK, for the time being, you just imagine this way. That there is an ele electron cloud, right? Say, suppose you have hydrogen. This is the nucleus and this is the electron cloud, right? Now, say, suppose you bring in a bring in an electron. You you put the hydrogen in front of the in front of an electrode for say you 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 apply 10 volts. Okay. Now what what will be the distortion of this electron flow? Say for hydrogen, you can expect there'll be very minimal distortion, right? But for say suppose uh, suppose uh, you have you have C CH3 CH3 CH3. CH3, right? You have a molecule like this. You may expect with the same field, you will be able to distort the electron cloud more. Why? Because this is a more bulky electron cloud, less, less influenced by the nucleus. You know, this type of this type of material has what? This type of material has lot of electron cloud around, you know, which will be more polarizable under a field than a very tight electron cloud around hydrogen, around the hydrogen nucleus. So in this situation, you can expect if this is a unit, if this is a unit, you may expect a delta plus, delta minus, this separation will be less. In this situation, the delta plus and delta minus, this separation will be a little bit more than this. So this material is more polarizable than this material. Clear? So essentially, a charge neutral electron cloud in presence of an electric field, how much the, the capacity to polarize, how much? And this polarization is not permanent. This is a temporary polarization. Moment I withdraw the electric field, it is going to get back to the original shell. Clear? Yes. Now, say, 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 this I have already described that this is the attraction arm, this is the repulsion arm. If I add, it is going to go like this. <clears throat> this stable, unstable, I'm coming a little later. Okay, these are the formulas that are given. So, this is the Coulombic, this is the Divide, this is the Kissam, this is the London, this is the Casimir, Casimir Polder. So, different types of ion, ion. Ion permanent dipole, permanent dipole, permanent dipole. So you can really add up all these things in order to define a define a potential 
that are going to be. So this is I'm talking about two atoms. Now this is going to go to the first to the molecular level and then this that is molecular level is going to go to the material level. This is the overall objective. Correct. So as we plotted, you can see beta x to the power minus six is the attraction arm. X to the power 12 is the repulsion arm and this 12 will be more effective when the distance is small and X six will be more effective when the distance is large. Anyway, see you can see that this is effective from say 0.3 nanometer, 0.4 nanometer to about about how much to about one nanometer. This is the atomistic lens scale. Correct. Now I get into the colloidal. Now I am getting to the surface tension slowly. So earlier I had, you know, in this situation, what I was discussing, I was discussing about two atoms with a nucleus and with an electron cloud into this. Now what I do, I keep one of them atom or molecule at that level. This is that my, you know, Leonard Jones thing, right? Whereas I create a block here. And block is what? Block, I assume that this, you know, this, this sort of unit, there are n number of such units in this block. Right? So how do I do that? So I say that now for this differential area, this is a kind of disk. You know, I choose a kind of deliberately, I choose a disk because I have to integrate over different direction in order to get the real number n. So what I say that for this differential element, D5, how do I define D5? You can see that what is what is rho? Rho is the density, right? Sorry, rho is the density. If I divide rho by the molecular weight, what do I get? Anybody, what do I get? If I define density divided by molecular weight, what should I get for a material? Jaldi se bolo. Bolne se jaldi ho jaga. Apiko bolna padega. What is the unit of rho? Kg per meter cube, right? Sir, moles per unit volume. Mole, mole density, right? Molar density, mole per unit volume, right? Very good. Now, one mole contains how much? How many molecules? Avogadron. Avogadro number. So we put Avogadro number in a. So what, what do I mean by rho in a? Sorry, rho in a by m. What does this parameter gives me? Number of molecules per unit volume. Number of molecules per unit volume. And then what I do if I multiply with the differential volume, which is 2 pi y. So you can see this is y. This is up to this, this is y, this is dy. So 2 pi y into dy, kya hai ki ye disk ka hai, and then you know this is your d zeta. So this is nothing but the differential volume. This is the this is the number of molecules. And then you will see I have a hidden beta by x to the power 6, which is which is my I'm not considering this 12 here. I'm just considering this attractive force. So what is d phi? d phi is the, the attractive force that is experienced by this molecule because of this disk. Is that clear? So instead of one to one, I am now considering a differential disk to one. Just I am multiplying with the number. As simple as that. Right? And then what I am doing, I am saying that this x is what? This x is nothing but z plus zeta whole square plus y plus y y whole square, right? So you can see that z plus x square is what? Z plus zeta whole square plus y square. So this x I replace by z plus zeta whole square plus y square. I replace it here. Now I have to integrate. Now if I integrate, Now, if I integrate, I have two limits, y equal to 0 to infinity and zeta equal to 0 to infinity. So, you know, 0 to infinity, y dy this, this leads to 1 by 4, 1 by z. So, I have not given you a lot of 
you know, for long, I think I have not given any assignment. So please perform this integration that when you integrate over zero to infinity, why you get this and then integrating over zeta, you know, zero to infinity, you get one by Z cube. Right, one by 12 Z cube. So if you just integrate over these two things, you are going to get what you are going to get. So, you know, if you just add up everything, so phi is how much? Phi is equal to rho by Na M beta pi. You know, these are all coming. So if I just, you know, assimilate all of them into constant, you know, all of them into constant, then what happens? Then what I get? This is a function. Phi is a function of what? Phi is a function of one by Z cube. Right? So when I started at the molecular level, this was a function of what? To the power six. Now, when I have started integrating, first level of integration with this volume, I have obtained what? Z cube. Now, what I do, I say I consider now this also a part of a block, which is again in number of molecules. So, this is where you will see the colloidal assemblies coming into picture. The bulk phases, surfaces, everything is coming into picture. From the molecular level, I'm integrating over two different elements to get the total measure of the total weak forces that are effective to it. So for this bulk, what should I do? Again, the same process. How many, how many molecules are there? Again, rho Na by M whole square, right? Beta, beta, beta 12, beta by 12 D square, right? You can, you can, you can very clearly see that for this also, for this block also, how many molecules are there? How many molecules are there for this block? You know, for this, this particular differential element, which is say, suppose DZ, what is D5? You can say that this can be repeated. Rho Na by M whole square, beta pi into 6z cube, you know, 6z cube into dz. So this is the this is the interaction of this. Let me just you know do it in a in a very elementary manner. So now after this, what am I trying? I am trying the interaction of this particular this particular part with the entire block. Right? What can be that? That is nothing but say phi is for a single atom here, right? Now, what I say D5 can be what? D5 is how much for all the molecules that are here? What are the all the molecules? I have this from phi and then I have the molecules here. So if rho is the density of this block, again rho by Na, sorry, rho Na into M is the number of molecules that are there. And for how many for the differential element, how much that is dz. Now for this, I already have rho in a m square, rho in a m, rho in a m beta pi by six z cube. So that is coming from this block. And the number of molecules are in this one. So if I add them up together, I get d5 to be like this. And then what I do, I do a I do an integration. Integration of how much integration over like, you know, this this part, I mean the entire this part, right? So if I do the integration, I end up getting I end up getting phi a is equal to what? Phi a is equal to minus rho in a by, by m square beta pi by 12 d square where, you know, you define a to be rho into n a. These are all constant pi m whole square into beta. This you define as a. And this is what is called the Hamaker constant. Essentially, this gives you phi a equal to a by 12 pi d square. Right? So what is this? This is nothing but this block interacting with this block we started with a pairwise interaction. Pairwise interaction. The so first first interaction level, the interaction of one of the pair molecules with the entire block. Then the interaction of block two with block one. 
If you just perform three integrations, you are able to get phi a, the interaction between two blocks. Say you can imagine that this is one nanoparticle, that is one nanoparticle. The interaction between the two nanoparticles is a by 12 pi. This, so at the atomic level, phi is this. Phi is equal to, if I consider phi equal to minus beta by x to the power 6, at the colloidal level, phi will become what? A by 12 pi x to the power, x to the power what? x to the power 2, right? That is what obtained, right? 12 pi d square. What does it say? Any idea? So x to the power 6 and x to the power 2, what does it say? First thing, when you have the minus sign, that means it's an attractive force. Okay, now what does the power say? Say when you had x to the power 12 as a repulsion force, right? So that was effective at a much smaller scale, right? When you have the attractive force, this was effective x to the power 6. This was effective at which length scale? Say until 1 nanometer, right? Now, when you have x to the power 2, this will be effective towards what? Until 100 nanometer. This is the length scale. So, why, why this is increasing? Because initially you had one molecule to one molecule interaction. The very weak forces associated with that. Right? That was also repulsion when they come closer. To, otherwise, since it is induction, you know, repulsion is all Coulomb. But if it is induction, it is always attractive. But when you have multiple, let me just draw you, draw the thing. See, when you have these two are touching to each other with a nucleus at the center, then this is this this repulsion is more of a kind of electrostatic. Correct? But then when they are a little bit separated, whatever attract, attractive forces are there. This is all weak attractive forces, and this is colloidal. This is beta to x to the power 6. This will always be attractive. Here, repulsive will not be there. But now, if I start accumulating this to be block 2, and if I start accumulating this to be block 1, what will happen? These weak forces will keep adding to each other to become of the order of x to the power 2, which will be effective say from one nanometer to about 100 nanometer. So the, these forces will be very, very, you know, crucial in this length scale. Why? Because as you keep adding them, see what we did when we did integration means we kept adding the, you know, these beta y x to the power 6, how many are there? Essentially, that's what we did at the level of one molecule to the multiple molecule of block 1, then with block 1 to block 2 to attain this potential. Right now, this is why this this effect is called the long range forces. So now, if you plot, how will it look like? If you plot, if you plot phi versus a, say suppose you know phi is varying. How how will, how phi is varying? Suppose phi is varying with respect to phi is equal to minus a by 12 pi d square, right? So what will be the phi versus d plot? Anybody tell me? How will it look like? How will it look like? Any idea? Jaldi batao. So phi, you have this and this phi at the molecular level, you have minus beta y x to the power 6. How will it look like? Say suppose this is 1 nanometer, suppose this is 10 nanometer, suppose this is 100 nanometer. Any clue? How will it look like? So this x to the power 6, will will you will see it will be very close to abscissa and then will start becoming predominant when it is less than 1. Whereas d square or 
x square, you will find like, you know, beta by d to the power 6, I just write. So you will find that they will be effective here. Why? Why this gap is generated? Because this is the this is the force. This is the body force. One to one interaction is getting converted to this is the picture that I wanted to give you that one to one interaction is getting into what? <clears throat> one to many. Polar polar, apolar apolar, polar apolar. Dipole dipole, induced dipole dipole, induced dipole induced dipole. That is the contour here. So when I discussed about this previously, you know, I discussed about what I told you what I told you that bigger inside is cavity. So what is the bigger inside? So let me just revisit from the beginning what we are discussing today. <clears throat> when you have a surface, when you have a liquid coming in, you know, this the spreading and duating is decided by what? You know, interfacial tension, surface tension is decided by what? Decided by the interaction between these two materials. And this interaction, you say surface tension, but it is nothing but <clears throat> it is the electromagnetic interaction between the molecules. Now it is pretty much clear to all of you. This is nothing but, you know, two different types of interactions. Either it can be an electrostatic interaction or it is a the, it is an induced dipole. You know, it's a Coulombic interaction or the Coulombic interaction which is generated because of the induction. These are the two different varieties that are possible here. This is wisdom number one. Now, when you when you really calculate gamma, you calculate based on two parts. One is the induction part, induced part, which is LW, which is the apolar part, and the other is the acid base part, which is the polar part. Either there is ion or there is a kind of dipole already present. So acid base part takes care of that. Whereas LW part is the apolar part. Right? Now in sir, that, yeah. Sir, this gamma positive, gamma negative is for ions. Gamma positive and gamma negative are for either ions or for dipoles. Say suppose so, you have a H2, right? It can become H plus and OH minus. See, dipole always, why, why you get from H2? You know, it is not very different. Say from H2, right? Why do you get H plus and OH minus? What is the process? The process starts with this. This is delta plus delta plus and this is delta minus delta minus. This is the starting point. Right? This is the starting point why, before yes. this goes off. So dipole is the initiation process. Presence of a permanent dipole is the initiation process of like, you know, the ionization. Correct. Now on the surface, whether it is in an ionic form or whether it is in a dipo dipolar form. So at this stage, whether it is in an ionic form or in a dipolar form, you, you do not worry about that. You do worry about what is the effective interaction because of the charges that are present at the interface. You worry about that. And that is what is effective gamma plus and effective gamma minus. This is an, this is an average. This is not you are getting at the molecular level. If there is a polar interaction, then how much polarity is remaining? You know, polarity and polarizability are two different terminologies, right? While polarizability is true for the induced induction part, polarity is associated with the, whether it is ion or it has a dipole moment. Clear? Now, this gamma plus is the effective plus that is there, and gamma minus is the effective gamma minus that is there. This is a statistical average property. So, gamma plus and gamma minus are equal. Gamma plus and gamma minus are equal in that sense, because always, you know, if OH minus is carrying minus, then H plus has to be. At the end, you have a charge neutral situation, even if it is ionization or it is having a dipolar charge separation. Right? Am I correct? Yes. So how we get this gamma 1 to a b term? Huh. So when you when I calculated no, say for 72. For 72.8. 
21 point is 8 is your LW. So 51 is your gamma AB, right? And in that gamma plus is 25.5, gamma minus is 25.5. <coughs> Okay. I'm asking about this expression. Gamma 1 to AB equal to 2. This gamma. is an averaging. This, this you have averaged it. See, you are, see, gamma, this is, this is for, see, I'm looking at 1 and 2. Okay. So in 1, gamma 1 is what? Gamma 1 LW plus gamma 1 AB, right? In 2, what is that? Say, suppose this is gamma 2 is gamma 2 LW. Gamma 2 LW plus gamma 2 AB, right? Now, in that AB, I know that what is gamma plus, gamma minus. Here also, I know that what is gamma plus and gamma minus. So, all four are opted. Now, when I am averaging out for gamma 1 LW, I am going to use this addition for this averaging formula. Whereas, I am going to go when I am going for gamma 1 to LW, I am going to use this averaging formula. <clears throat> So what is that? Gamma 1 plus gamma 2 root. That means 25.5, 25.5 root. That means 25.5. Gamma 2, gamma 2. Then gamma 1, gamma 2 minus. So this is what? This if 1 remains 1, 2 remains 2. Then minus of what? If 1 is in close vicinity of 2 and 2 is in close vicinity of 1. So this part will be neutralized and this, this part will be effective. The difference between these two is give, going to give you the net, net acid base interaction. You can imagine near the interface, there are pluses, there are minuses also. So here there are pluses, there are minuses, here minuses and pluses, all are there. So this expression is going to give you the average effective that is remaining when one in coming close to one was individual, two was individual. These are the two in those sort of situation. But they, when come they close to each other, this part has been neutralized, this part has been neutralized. So the effective part is remaining as gamma 1 to AB. Is it clear? Uh, this gamma 1, gamma 2 is for attraction or for repulsion between these two? Which one? Uh, root gamma 1 positive uh, into root gamma 2 negative. Are these two neg um, negative terms? This, these two? Mm, these yes. two neg negative terms. These two negative terms because, see, when you had, when, say, suppose when you had individual, say, when they were not, they did not come close to each other. When one was one, two was two in vacuum. Right? Those are the first two terms. But mm. when they have yes. come close to each other, they, there are interactions. So one has a plus and minus, two also has a plus and minus. They are interacting with each other. A part of that is nullified. <clears throat> See, because of this plus, some of these minuses are nullified and some of these minuses plus is nullified. Right? Am I correct? Am I correct? These yes. are those two parts. But there is attraction also. What is attraction? Uh, between one and two. Don't don't mix with attraction with this. Okay. You you the attraction has already happened and the association has already taken place. At this stage, I am trying to figure out what is the acid base component of interfacial tension. This particular formula gives you the see surface tension is a is an is a average parameter. It is not a molecular parameter. Okay, it's an average parameter. It's a statistical average, right? So while this is I am going top down, there I am going bottom up, and later on I am going to merge them together. Right? I am coming to that. But this is a top-down approach. This is a this is an average property, measurable average property, which has a which has a apolar component, which has a polar component. So apolar component I am, but then when I am taking surface tension to interfacial tension, 
so when two surfaces are coming to each other and having undergoing an addition in that sort of situation there is an energy release right because of the addition that has taken place the energy has released that release of energy has two types one is the apolar interaction attraction which is calculated like this whereas this is the acid base interaction which is calculated like calculated like that Correct. Now this is this I am calculating, assuming that they are the oil and water is sitting towards each other. There is a polar part in oil. There is an apolar part in oil. There is a polar part in water. There is an apolar part in water. So if they were individual, this was the energy, average energy. You know, this is the total average energy when they came closer to each other. These are the interaction that took place between them. Average interaction that took place between them. So this is the effective inter interfacial tension that is remaining. <clears throat> Here, I am not getting into the molecular level. Here, gamma minus means effectively, say suppose n number of molecules, how much you know possibility of having minus. Then, when we, then, then what we did, we raised the concept of then how these electrical interactions are manifested as surface tension, right? So we started bottom up. So we are saying that it is not point mass. There are three different types of interactions between them. Induced dipole, induced dipole, permanent dipole, permanent dipole, and permanent dipole, induced dipole. We quantified that at the atomic level, right? We, we have classified them. What are the Coulombic, what are the Debye, Kisam, London, Kasimi, different types of interaction. Then what we did, we integrated over the surfaces. Now you see I am arriving slowly at the surface tension integrated over the surfaces to get what is the total integrated value of the potential. I have arrived at the level of the potential, right? With the Hamegar constant, this is an expression for what? This is an expression for, sorry, this will be a little bit higher. So this is an expression for what? This is the expression for the potential that we have obtained. A by 12 pi d square, right? Now you will see, you know, when I, when I say that, See, this is where now I'm I'm coming and merging the whole thing where this this all these interactions are together. Say suppose you have a you have a surface D, you have a you have a you have a surface D which is coming, which is surrounded by a surface D1 and which is sur uh, surrounded by a surface D1 and D2. Right? What is the delta G associated with that? Free energy associated with that, because this is what we have calculated here, right? What is the free energy associated with that? The free energy is said that A by 12 pi. Now 1 by D2 plus D plus D1, the entire distance whole square. Okay, so addition is the total and only this width. So 1 by D plus D1 plus D2 whole square plus 1 by D square. And what is the subtraction? Subtraction is D2 plus D and D1 plus D. See, this is the effective free energy to bring them in to closer towards each other. What does it mean? If this delta G, you know, if I put all the values and if I get this delta G to be negative, then this is a spontaneous process. What is the equivalent to the surface tension interpretation? Say, suppose this is one and surrounded by two and three. So what is delta G of one surrounded by three and two is gamma three, two. That means when these two are close to each other, minus gamma 1, 2 plus gamma 3, 1. If this is negative, if this is negative, then only this is going to survive here. If this is positive, then this is not going to survive here. Okay. Now, here, as you can imagine, we have embedded all these polar, apolar, why? Because in this D, you can understand that in this A, I have embedded, A has this omega constant has a part of what? As a part of this induced dipole, induced dipole, induced dipole, dipole, and dipole, dipole. All these are embedded inside that. Right? So those plus minus I have already integrated here. And as the reason, now when I'm calculating this, I'm going to take when I'm calculating in this way, I'm going to separate out. See, when I'm calculating like this, this A has the information of 
all these electrostatic interaction. While I'm calculating this, this gamma will have LW and AB, and from the physical properties, we are going to bring in gamma plus, gamma minus, and gamma LW. If I bring in these three parameters, then this delta G maps with this delta G. Is that clear? Clear hua nahi hua. Jaldi se batao. Questions ki puste uske baad chup ho jate. This is the problem. You people don't interact. Sir, if this uh, first entity will not survive, then what's going to happening with this? Which one? Which is not going to survive? Uh, uh, if delta G is positive. See, there are then... two ways. You know, see, what are the two possibilities here? Either one will remain here or uh, one will drain out and two, three will merge, right? Okay. Right, so there are two possibilities. Either one will be there. If it is stable, one will be there. If it is not stable, two, three will merge, one will drain out. Similar here. You are asking the question that whether this is a stable configuration or D is going to go away. We are going to study multiple cases next class, how this happens. It's a pictorial representation of that, right? Whether this is an addition between D1 and D2, or addition failure between D1 and D2. See, if D survives, then there will be an, this two will be chip ke gaya. Like if D nikal gaya, to D1 and D2 chip gaya. So suppose you have a envelope, you know, two paper surfaces and air in the middle, right? If they, they bind with each other, and the, if air flows out, then this is an addition. If they don't stick to each other, there is an addition failure. And it depends on how much free energy that is released when this process is happening. And that is connected with what? That is connected with all the electrostatic interactions. You know, pairwise interactions that you have assimilated in this form. So this has, you know, we discussed about this, say one and two coming. So one, two is, you know, when they join each other, one, two. When they are separated, one and two. So delta G is negative means addition and delta G is positive means addition failure. And we came from the molecular interaction perspective to this level. Correct? Yes, sir. Understood? Clear? Yes. Sir. Right. Now you can see that you can play around very nicely. This say suppose one and two you are playing. See, this is the most generic formula. You can use for a number of surfaces, this one. So suppose I want to study one and two. You see what, how do I do that? You know, delta G one, two. If I really want to do, if I put, uh, uh, say, suppose D two in this situation, I put this to infinite, that to infinite. I just keep this one. So D two to infinity, D one to infinity. So what will happen to this term? One plus D one plus D two plus D plus D1 plus D2, what will happen if D1 tends to infinity and D2 tends? Only D has a finite number. I have two semi-infinite surfaces separated by a distance D. What is going to happen? Zero. This is zero. What, we, what, what is going to happen? D plus D2, zero. D plus D1, zero. So these three goes. So delta G12 will become what? A12. You know, D is absent by 12 pi D squared. What is this formula? What is this formula? Delta G12 is gamma 12 minus gamma 1 plus gamma 2. Correct? Now I can map these two against each other. Sorry. I can map to I can map this against each other. So what am I doing? I am calculating delta G12 using this formula, delta G12 using my surface tension formula, right? And then I am saying that delta G, delta G when these two touch each other, just, you know, they are coming closer, 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 and then touching each other, just, you know, touching each other. So 
you know, the definition goes that from D0, you know, what is the potential energy difference? Say, say from infinity, you bring them to zero, right? So you will see that delta G1 to D0 will become A1 to divided by 12 pi D0 square. When they are coming, so what am I saying that two surfaces are separated G infinity, two semi-infinite surfaces are separated at infinite, but they are slowly coming and they are coming to a cutoff distance D0 because beyond D0, you know, it is not possible to physically progress, correct? Because there is a repulsion that I am appreciating. Now, if I do that, what I get delta Z1 to D0 is what is, you know, A, A1 to divided by 12 pi D0 square. Just I am replacing this D with D0. G infinity, I know that D equal to infinity is, you know, that is zero. So this is my delta G12, right? Now for one equivalent to two, if one and two are equal, I have to write minus A11 12 pi D0 square. This is one, this is one. Correct? If both of them are one, so essentially I'm performing a cohesion, cohesive interaction. One is coming closer towards one. So this is a kind of cohesive interaction. So minus A11 12 pi D0 square. In cohesive interaction, what will happen? This gamma 1, 2 will be 0. This will be gamma 1. This will be gamma 1, right? So this will be minus 2 gamma 1. So A11 is equal to 24 pi D0 square gamma 1. So you see that now your surface tension is connected to A. A has three components. Is D by Kisam London. Gamma 1 has three components. That is gamma LW, gamma plus, gamma minus. This is where the all the all the all the interactions that meet with the average properties now gamma 1 is positive that means a11 needs to be positive right now let us see if this is if, if these two are same right so i can write a12 by 12 pi d square is equal to this so if i do that now you can write gamma 1 to equal gamma 1 plus gamma 2 2 root gamma 1 gamma 2 this is just by averaging like that in LW, if you put that way, A12 will become 24 pi D0 square root over gamma 1, gamma 2. So all these surface tension values can be mapped to the Hamaker constant and the Hamaker constant can be mapped to the surface tension. And what is surface tension? Surface tension, although it is manifesting as a surface force, but it is nothing but, you know, um, uh, it's a, it's the, the, the origin is, is basically the body force. It's the pairwise interaction of the of the of the pairwise weak interactions between the dipoles between the dipole and induced dipole and between the induced dipole and induced dipole is that clear easily my bol raha tha lecture miss karna nahi hai right this is this is the heart of the whole game most of the people don't understand what is surface tension and all the reason behind that you know they, they don't get this much of depth in terms of their understanding. So now you can really think about that there is a surface and there is a film. So I'm going for those lens formation, film formation and all. And you can just bring in this formula and cook up like, you know, different types of interactions, put interaction potentials. You now we may discuss about this IJ. You know, these are formulas you can make use of different types of pairwise additions and all. You can create different types of systems based on you know, this common generic platform that has been shown here. You know, this is the platform through which you can really, this is the platform through which really you can kill all the problems. This is the macroscopic description. This is the top-down description. This is the bottom-up descriptions from the pairwise molecular interaction, adding all the molecular weaker and stronger attractive forces. You can add up and getting into this. Whereas you can add up and getting into this from the statistical average properties that are measured experimentally. And then you can do a one to one correlation with them to see like, you know, any type, say DNA interacting with with antigen antibody interaction, you know, the structure of DNA, all these things, you know, they have they have this sort of interactions embedded inside them, you know, starting from the molecular level to the colloidal level to the gaseous level to the to the gas laws everywhere you will find this to be imperative okay i just leave you know this derivation as a assignment to you 
that there is a surface, there is a sphere. So please derive the formula for that. You know, this you submit as an assignment. Okay. And sometimes, you know, I tell you, like, you know, this pensum, you know, I'm going to give you to derive one of these formula. See, you know, we, right now we have derived this interaction for, say, two blocks, right, which is the simplest one. So this one is between a block and a sphere. Now here you will have two sphere, two sphere of equal radius, two sphere. So I would suggest you to derive all of them and submit, you know, these as assignments. Okay. So formula method remains to be the same. Right. This is this is the two blocks. I have derived this, right? Two plates of equal thickness. This I have already shown. Right. Now these spherical surfaces, this is the generic formula, and these are the asymptotic formula. I mean simpler formula. So you you derive all these things and submit as assignment. So that will improve your insight. Any questions? Any question you have? No, if not, so we meet on Friday. Okay, Acha. The another point is that next week is a holiday week, right? Hello, am I audible? Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, next week is a holiday week. I like to take a few makeup classes. Okay, so is it possible that Monday and Wednesday we take makeup classes? 14th and 16th? Is it okay with all of you? Same time, 6, 30, 6 to 7 30. Okay. Is it fine with all of you? Oh, okay. Uh, Vinod, please announce everybody that okay, sir. Uh, that that eleventh is the next class, and fourteenth and sixteenth we will have to make up classes so that you know we remain on par with the pace. Okay, eighteenth is anyway holiday, and then we'll take up from twenty first onwards. I think they are coming back to the campus. Okay. Okay then, Chalo, bye bye. See you on Friday. 6 p.m. Sir.